Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, between you and the coffee break lie 140 years of economic history. Um, the good news is that I tried to cover 10 years in about a minute, so um, it's going to be going to be quick. What I want to do here is to give you an overview of a research agenda that um, Oscar Jordan, who's here, and Alan Taylor um, and I have uh, pursued over the past uh, couple of years. At the heart of our research stands the idea that uh, in order to find answers to the questions we're discussing here over the past two days, the role of debt, credit, financial factors in the business cycle, but also policy responses, uh, we really need to bring economic history back in. And uh, we need better empirics for better theory. And uh, in order to get that better theory, we need to you know, paint on a larger canvas and uh, go back in time to get more realistic descriptions of the macroeconomy. So you, you get an idea what's going to come. It's going to be heavy on, heavy on data and heavy on facts. Um, as I'm trying to summarize what has come out of that um, research line, uh, and what we know, what we think we know, what we don't know. Steve, did you, did you take the, <laughs> thanks. So the view from, the view from history. Uh, I mentioned this joint work with, with Oscar and Alan. What we did, really the backbone of our study is a new data set that we put together and uh, that covers 140 years of macroeconomic hist history, annual data for 14 countries uh, since 1870. These 14 countries are the usual suspects in a way. There's France, there's the UK, US, Germany, Italy, uh, Spain, Japan, and a few others. And uh, we're currently working in the context of our INET grant on uh, enlarging that data set, making it even uh, more detailed. It's uh, public on the, on the internet, so feel free to use it. Um, you, you might also ask, what, what does it have to do with the work that, that Carmen and, and Ken have done? Well, the, the difference we, we point out is that Carmen and Ken have really cataloged public debt data. And um, so sort of our work focuses on private debt. So uh, when I refer to credit and, and debt over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I was referred to uh, bank debt to the domestic non-financial uh, sector. Yeah. Let me start with giving you kind of the uh, quick overview of the two uh, sort of key charts that we bring together. So first of all, here is a, uh, a sort of timeline of financial crisis. It's just, it's just an incidence ratio. So what share of the countries in our sample were in the financial crisis in any given year? And uh, you see something that uh, probably the fans of, Brett, of the Bretton Woods regime will, will have noticed already. Uh, we have a relatively high crisis frequency under the gold standard in the interval years. And then there is this 25-year period of, of zero crisis of financial calm. And then here, um, sort of in the last 25 years, um, financial crisis frequency picks up again. You also see that there are five, if you will, five global clusters of crises, one sort of in the 18, early 1870s, um, then in the 1890s, 1907, the Great Depression, and now the Great Recession. Um, that's sort of the one, one side of, of our work, is to sort of look at these incidents of systemic financial instability. The other side I mentioned is we bring that together with our long-run credit data. And that is a key chart um, that um, I invite you to to, to study for a second, it basically tells one eye-catchingly simple story right away, which is uh, from 1870, you see three lines here, bank loans over GDP, that's the blue line, bank assets over GDP, that's the red line, and then the green line is a, a broad monetary aggregate, typically M2. And well, one, the, the clear story is we have this massive increase in uh, economy-wide uh, leverage or debt levels in the past uh, 30, 40 years to historically unprecedented levels. But there also is a sort of slightly more nuanced, more subtle uh, story in the sense that before, sort of until, nine, until the Second World War, you see that these ag aggregates move very closely. They really move closely together. It's sort of closely correlated. And uh, we think that's really sort of the world that, that Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz described. That's your classical monetarist view where uh, bank liabilities and bank assets move together, where possibly central banks can even steer uh, bank, li uh, bank uh, assets by, by steering uh, sort of liabilities, steering the money side. But then these relationships break down after World War II, and uh, credit and money decouple. Yeah? And then there's an argument that will 
may, might have uh, later. What is really the timing? Is that, is that already sort of the post-World uh, War II immediate period, or is that when Bretton Wood, Woods breaks down? But credit and money decouple in the second half of the 20th century, and a very, a very odd thing happens in the past 20 years, namely that the credit aggregate sort of cuts through the money aggregate, um, which uh, reflects the rise of uh, non-monetary financing uh, of the banking system. So wholesale funding um, and, and other forms of non-monetary liabilities that the banks use to uh, fund uh, credit. The, um, looking at these two, the, the crisis incidents and, and the, the long-run credit data, looking at them together, what are the key points I can make today or we, we find in our research. Well, first, crises are typically credit booms gone bust. This is not an entirely new story, uh, although we sort of are probably the first to document this using these long-run data. Bill White sits there and together with Claud Claudio Borio, um, there's, you've done empirical work on that. Others have worked on that as well. But I think there is now, on the basis of these long-run data, there's relatively sound and clear evidence that crises can be viewed as, as credit booms gone bust, and I'll show you why in a second. Second, we show that, or we find that the policy responses, both monetary and fiscal, to financial crises have changed markedly. And I'll show you, i show you, we've become much more activist, and I'll show you in a chart how. Third point is, uh, what we think of um, in our latest paper as a new stylized fact of the modern business cycle. Namely, we call that credit bites back. Um, more credit intensive booms, more credit intensive upswings, expansions of the business cycle tend to be followed by more severe recessions. Um, and that is true whether you speak of a normal recession without any incidents of financial instability or whether you speak, and it's, more, it's, it, it's even stronger, uh, when the recession coincides with the financial crisis. And I'll show you some evidence uh, for that as well. And the last point is I make some tentative, really tentative conclusion about the remedies because, um, well, I think, uh, Oscar, that's, we are not that far yet that we can avoid financial crisis. So, crisis as credit booms gone bust. Um, acceleration of credit growth is the best early warning signal for crisis. Um, in, in, put differently, we have a good idea about the proximate causes of financial crisis credit growth and acceleration of, of, uh, of, of, of lending. Um, we have not the same understanding of the fundamental cause, i.e., why does credit growth all of a sudden accelerate? So there might be a role for monetary policy, might have to do with capital flows, um, but sort of on a, if, if, you, if you, maybe the best comparison is sort of with the weather forecast. Yeah, we, we, we see the storm brewing. We don't have a good idea what causes the storm, but we see the storm brewing and approaching the, uh, the coastline. Um, we also find in, in, a, in a paper that we did last year that um, kind of contrary to conventional wisdom, I might say, the role of current account balances is less clear cut, at least for our sample of 14 countries here that does not include any emerging markets. Um, and um, sort of the conclusion overall that we take from that in terms of policy is that a central bank that follows a policy rule that does not uh, you know, um, pay attention to credit and misses information that kind of systematically helps to tell you what will happen to your economy down the road. This is um, enough. Um, this is uh, credit to GDP for the UK in the last 130 years in this case, and it shows you that pattern of credit boom followed by a crisis. The grey bars being the years in which the UK economy experiences systemic financial crisis. If I, had a, if I had a point I could show you, you see the run up, especially in the second half of the 20th century, run up in credit, boom, crisis, then next credit boom, crisis, followed by next credit boom. If you put that for 14 countries over these 140 years in a regression framework, you get, I'm not gonna uh, bore you with the results, but you get very significant and, and strong indications that uh, you can exploit that information about accelerations of credit growth to predict um, financial crisis down the road. Um, we also, and that's why you have three columns there, if you do the same, because the ECB often says, yeah, that's why we have this monetary pillar, so we tested um, whether money works as well as credit, and the answer is clearly no. If you want to have that sort of financial stability um, 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 
objective as a central bank, you probably want to look at credit aggregates and not at monetary aggregates. Um, so now I say, okay, we can predict financial crisis. You say, yeah, that's not possible. Well, of course, it's never precise. But um, if you put yourself in the position of a policymaker, you can ask so how much using that model, using information about credit and money trend, or especially credit trends in the economy, um, how good how does my does my oops, does my forecasting ability uh, outperform a simple coin toss? And that's what this chart does. The green line basically gives you uh, gives you the coin toss. So yeah, it's going to be crisis or no, yes or no. You just throw a coin. And if you use the model in, in the case of the um, of the green greenish, the model one, uh, this is a pure credit model. Um, you outperform that coin toss significantly. There is predictive ability uh, that you can exploit. Um, there are three lines here. The th th kind of thickish blue line is a model that doesn't only look at credit, but also integrates current account deficits, current account balances. And um, as you can see, it improves, it improves sort of the overall predictive ability of the model a little bit, but not an awful lot. So uh, sort of we, we came away thinking credit is really the dominant variable you want to watch. Policy responses, I'll be short on that. Uh, there are dramatic policy differences in the policy responses post-World War II and pre-World War II. Uh, that's clearly visible in both monetary and fiscal, uh, the monetary and fiscal aggregates. Um, what's the story? Well, the lessons of the Great Depression were clearly learned. Um, the more problematic um, conclusion might be that if you, re if you recall that massive increase in leverage that has taken place in, uh, in the 20th century, um, you probably want to ask to what degree that policy parachute has encouraged that leverage build out, right? And I, 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 show, you, um, I show you how, the, um, how, that, how these two fights might be, uh, facts might be related. Uh, last point, the real cost, and that's what we're experiencing at the moment, despite much more activist policy intervention, the real costs of financial crisis have also remained high. So, um, you know, a cynic might say, and I show you that in the chart now, uh, that we've been very good at bailing out the financial sector repetitively, but we haven't learned all, I mean, we've avoided another Great Depression, that's clearly a success, but um, we haven't, we still face real costs of financial crisis. So here's the chart that tracks the policy, that tracks the behavior of three macro aggregates, namely bank assets, broad money, and bank loans, in the years following a financial crisis. So normal stands for, this is sort of the average of the pre-World War II years, this is in normal times. Zero is the year of the financial crisis, and then it's one, two, three, four, five years after. And what you see in the pre-World War II data, you get this V-shaped deleveraging, right? So money and credit growth really collapse, go far below trend, even in the case of bank lending, negative for a year, um, and um, sort of, you know, an idea of a V-shaped Hands off central banks, we get V-shaped deleveraging, it really hurts um, in the financial sector and the economy. By the way, this looks very much the same uh, if, when, if we exclude the Great Depression. It's not driven by that. Um, on the right side, you see the development of the very same aggregates in financial crisis after World War II. And what you see is that you know, the, the V-shaped deleveraging basically is a story of the past. Central banks come in, support the economy, support money growth, support um, the um, financial sector, and we don't get the same uh, strong response in, in these, um, in these uh, indicators. Um, very much same story for fiscal policy. So this chart, is, this, this table is, is, is just tells you uh, what the cumulative increase in public debt is following in the five years following a financial crisis. And it does so by relative to country-specific trends. Let me be specific about that. Um, so um, it, the, the, in, in the, the first line, is all, it shows you the, the coefficient for all years, which the 0.13 basically indicates we have a 13% cumulative increase in the public debt to GDP ratio. 
um, following a financial crisis in over these 140 years of uh, modern economic history. But the real story is in the breakdown between the different eras. Pre-World War II, there's next to nothing. Post-World War II, public debt to GDP increases by about 31% cumulatively. And if, you, if we look at a further subsample and look at the post-1975 era and look at countries with large financial sectors, we're up to 50%. By the way, if that sounds large to you, this is, prob this is compared to what we're seeing right now in many countries, still uh, very relatively low. Um, my, my last sort of um, main point is credit and the business sector. I mentioned at the beginning that um, in, our in the most recent paper, we look at the role that credit plays in um, shaping the, uh, or influencing real sector dynamics, shaping the business cycle. And we found uh, that there is an, an important and possibly overlooked stylist effect of the modern business cycle, namely a close relationship between the buildup of leverage in the expansion phase and the severity of the subsequent recession. Simple story, more credit intensive booms tend to be followed by deeper recessions. That's based on a study of nearly 200 recession episodes. And we also show in the paper that uh, leverage very, very specifically shapes the recession path of key aggregates such as investment, lending, bank lending, and inflation. Um, here is a chart. Uh, this, is a, this is a table giving you just a simple sort of exploratory regression. Basically, it tells you that the growth rate of output and the growth rate of consumption is much stronger when excess loan, the excess loan to GDP growth rate, which is the ratio by which l bank loans grew faster than GDP in the previous expansion phase, is, I think this is yeah, one standard deviation um, above. So um, the idea here, really, more, the more credit, the more credit intensive uh, expand your expansion is as an economy, the more, uh, the, the higher the fragility, the greater the risk, or the, 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 the more um, um, pronounced the subsequent downturn. And you know, these, these figures are relatively meaningful. So we have 69 basis points per annum for output. And if you interact that um, in, in, in with um, even sort of the loan to GDP level, um, so if more financialized, if you will, economies, these effects grow even stronger and they're particularly pronounced in the case of consumption. Um, little, little more detail here, this is, I'm not gonna go um, exact, but this is, this is basically a chart that shows you how um, a, as an experiment when sort of leverage grew in the expansion phase by 10% more than, than the mean, so we sort of run an experiment and say, okay, what happens to uh, these economic um, um, data, to the economic aggregates, like here, real GDP, investment to GDP, and real private loans, when the recession is not a normal recession where everything is uh, just the average, but when it's a sort of a leveraged recession. And our experiment is your 10% excess um, um, loan growth in the previous expansion. And you can see that both in normal recessions, that's the red line, and, and, but more pronounced in financial recessions, leverage really makes things worse. And the impact comes both through investment to GDPs, so though investment is depressed for a long time, and in financial crisis recessions, it's particularly through the lending behavior of the um, banking sector. Whether that's a supply or demand story, as um, you know, recent papers uh, by Mian and Sufi or Philippon um, and uh, Thomas Philippon from NYU and others have shown that's kind of an open question. We have some hints that interest rates in more leveraged, uh, in, in more leveraged recessions, interest rates tend to fall sharper. So that would tend to argue for a, uh, for, for a demand, not for a supply of credit um, driven uh, explanation, but we have to be relatively quiet on that. Um, let me conclude by um, telling, giving you some kind of skepticism from an economic historian um, about the remedies to financial crisis. So um, if you look at 140 years of, of uh, financial history, you'll find that financial crises have occurred when capital ratios were as high as they were in the 19th and early 20th century. And very often here we're talking about 20%, 30% uh, capital ratios, you know, along the lines of what's proposed now. And that doesn't mean that that's a bad idea, not at all. But it's not the, um, clearly not the um, um, uh, solution for, for financial crisis. Financial crises have occurred even 
E, uh, with high capital ratios. The same is true for gold standard and fiat money. We had crisis under the gold standard, crisis under fiat money, we had crisis under fixed and floating exchange rates with and without central banks and with or without current account deficits. So clearly there is a, um, you know, to the degree that we, we've talked this morning about psychological um, approaches, there seems to be uh, some merit that uh, the instability is, is, is inherent. There's one clear point, um, if I may recall again, that long-run leverage chart um, is that um, the relationship between money and credit aggregates has changed. Um, this, the rise of wholesale funding has brought new risks, and to the degree that uh, regulatory arbitrage was a driver, it needs to be fixed. Um, with respect to, and that's really my last slide and last word, um, to policy frameworks, I come away, and that's, more, that's my personal, uh, opinion um, as all of that, that uh, policy frameworks that rely on strong price about the stability and financial markets, of financial markets are problematic and probably inflation targeting by uh, excluding um, or neglecting the financial sector has maybe not caused but definitely contributed to the size of the recent credit bubble. So I guess the historian would say discretion and wariness is what central banks should have as a principle, and rules and benign neglect are not a good idea. Thank you. Thank you.